ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول كل بدعة ضلالة Uh, people who ascribe themselves to Salafiyya, whether in Britain, whether in this land, Pakistan or elsewhere, and they look towards uh, some of the conduct of the likes of Al-Maktabat al-Salafiyya in the UK and other places, and they look at them and they regard them to be harsh. You know, they regard them to be severe because they criticize that one and they criticize that one and they talk about the misguidance of this one and they refute that one so can you shed some light on how these types of masail are to be understood first and foremost we take the position of the salaf of this ummah and the asal of the deen and that is that no person is to be unjustly refuted or corrected without evidence the dalil or the adilla drives us, meaning that when we correct a person, and Ahlul Sunnah can correct each other. For example, if I make a mistake, or uh, our brother Ustad Zubair makes a mistake, or Ustad Tariq makes a mistake, or Abu Hakim makes a mistake, or any of the brothers makes a mistake, then between Ahlul Sunnah we rectify. And we say, yeah, Akhi, you made a mistake in your understanding of that hadith or you misquoted the hadith or you quoted a hadith that was weak and so on this is this is by way of ahlu sunnati wal jama'ah fulfilling the obligation of clarification of the religion those who remove from the religion that which is not from it and this is an obligation from the salaf of this ummah till now that's why when the people used to stand in the in front of the prophet sallallahu make a mistake did he not correct them he always used to correct them he used to correct their mistakes they used to come to him and ask him about tayammum, about tahara, about things that they used to do, and he used to correct them and show them the correct way. And likewise, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. As for those people who oppose the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the usul of the deen, or in the faru of the deen, stubbornly rejecting the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and choosing a path other than the path of the Sahaba, or that they criticize the Sahaba, or that they vilify the Sahaba, or that they speak about the Aqeedah with ignorance, or they say that Allah fi kulli makan, that Allah is in every place, or they say that it is allowed to build tombs and structures over graves, or that they say that you can seek nearness to Allah by asking the dead one in the grave by making tawassul through him, or that they hold that the marching in the streets and demonstrations in the streets is from the deen of Allah or that they hold it is permissible to rebuke and refute the Muslim ruler and speak out against him in public all of these are mukhalafat of the foundations of the religion anyone who denies the names and attributes of Allah then he is a jahmi anyone who makes ta'wil of the, of the sifat of Allah of the attributes of Allah then he is ash'ari or he is maturidi, he is, he is deviating from that which the salaf of this ummah were upon. Or the one who says that I reject the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, but I will only accept the Qur'an. Then he has rejected the Qur'an itself because Allah in the Qur'an commands them to take from the Messenger of Allah وسلم. So the question is now when a person falls into these types of errors, there are two types of people. Either the one who fell into these types of errors of opposing something from the fundamentals of the religion or something even from the affairs that are established in ibadah such as the salah or siyam or zakah or other than that and he's clearly deviated either he is a person who deviates and he is his deviation is with himself meaning that he doesn't publicize it in which case this person needs to be advised privately you tell him that what you just said to me it is forbidden it is haram you're not allowed to curse the Sahaba. You're not allowed to speak about Muawiyah radiallahu anhu except with khair. Why? Because he's the khal of the ummah. He is the, uh, you know what, khal of the mamu, huh? He is the uncle of the ummah, meaning the maternal uncle of the ummah. Because he is the brother of the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Or they say that it is allowed to rebel against the Muslim rulers. Or this Muslim ruler, this hukumran, that he does such and such and such and such and we should rebuke him because he doesn't send the French ambassador home. That is not for you to decide. That's for the ruler to decide. This is not your, you know, you don't make the dakhul 
in these types of affairs and say, well, I disagree with the ruler and I'm going to write it on YouTube or I'm going to vi video it on YouTube or I'm going to put it in a Twitter that I disagree with this ruler because he should send the ambassador home. Then tomorrow, who do you want to send home? German one? American one? Who are you going to send home? Are the French worse than the Americans? Really? What about the British ones? What about the Belgian ones? Anytime you're not happy with the ambassador, you're going to demand from the Muslim ruler that he rule, and if he does not, we're going to object to you and we're going to revile you and we're going to, you know, speak ill of you. This is the dakhul in the affairs of the rulers that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not permit. So when we see people, let's say now this person, as I mentioned, it is one and one between you and him. So you advise him and you correct him and you rebuke him and you remind him of Allah and you remind him of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if, someone, if any of you sees from his ruler that which, that, that which he hates, then let him take the ruler by his hand and advise him in private and let him not make that public. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, don't make it public. What do they do? Make it public. So you say to him, Ya Akhi, one to one, I'm advising you. Now, another, so that's one body of people, meaning that these are just individuals, maybe someone that you met or someone that is related to you, someone who comes to your house, someone who may be fixing, you know, he's the gardener or something. So you advise him one to one because this is his mistake individually, so you advise him individually. There's no need to now plaster that on the internet. Why? Because this is one person. As for the one whose mistake is public for all of the ummah to see and he calls them to misguidance in opposing the usul of the deen then it is wajib by fard, by fard kifaya it is an obligation upon a group of the ummah to correct his mistake if he is a caller from the callers as he claims to Islam. So if this is a person now who calls to make in takfir of the Muslim rulers, he says the Muslim rulers are unbelievers, then he must be corrected. If he made it public, then his correction must be public. Why? Because he has misguided or he has given this false information to maybe thousands of people. Who's going to correct those thousands of people? Someone says, yeah, Ahi, don't correct him in public. Say, no, it is allowed to correct him in public. Why? Because his mistake was in public. Does it mean you have to be harsh? And that depends upon the situation. That depends upon the situation. If this person is a mu'anid and you're trying to warn the people against him and you're trying to warn the people of his errors, then yes, some harshness is required so that the people know by following him, he will deviate you. Like the takfiri who declares the Muslim rulers to be kuffar. Or the one who, you know, calls the people to march out in the streets and he publicizes that. Then that person by name can be refuted. Did not Imam Udarimi write the book? Naq. Uthman bin Sa'id Al Al Bishr Al Jahmi Al Anid Al Marisi. This is the book of the great Imam. This mark is Imam al Darimi. The book is by Imam al Darimi. Rahimahullah. You know, in the era of Ahmed, this Imam wrote a book in which the title of the book is a refutation of one of the Imams of misguidance, Bishr al-Marisi, who he referred to as al-Anid, al-Jahmi al-Anid, the stubborn Jahmi he called him, al-Anid. When Sheikh Muqbil refuted some of the innovators, he has a book with the title, Kalb al-Awi. You know, the, what is it, the, how would you translate it? The, the howling of the dog. This is the, the beginning of the title of the book of, of Al Imam, you know, Al Muhaddith Muqbil bin Hadi Al Wadi'i, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The purpose of that is to warn the people about this public figure who continues year in and year out to misguide thousands, if not millions, of Muslims with his misguidance with takfir, with revolution, with bloodshed, with suicide bombings, calling the people, even the women, in some of their fatawa of these Ahlul Bid'ah, Ikhwan al muslimin and others, that they say that even women can partake in suicide. It's bad enough that they push men, which is haram, and now they want women to go in and also participate in suicide bombings, in, 
you know, in, in, in cities of, in, in, uh, in, the, in the land of the Jews and other places similar to that. But the point here being is that the refutation of Ahlul Bid'ah, if it is in its right place, and if that person has deviated, and you can show that he has deviated, like Bishr, like Bishr al-Marisi who deviated and Imam Darmi refuted him, like uh, Ibn Abi Du'ad who Imam Ahmed refuted and called him a Jahmi, like Ya'qub bin Shayba who uh, when, when they asked Imam Ahmed he said Khabith, Khabith Jahmi, Mubtadi, Sahib Bid'a, Sahib Hawa. This is a statement of Imam Ahmed about who? Ya'qub bin Shayba. And you say, well, Ya'qub bin Shayba must have been a real deviant for Imam Ahmed to use those kind of words. Actually, Ya'qub bin Shayba, he fell into the bid'ah of, of laf, al laf, which is basically the bid'ah of saying that my recitation of the Quran is created. He had a musnad in a hadith, 30 volumes, Ya'qub bin Shayba. Imam Ahmed used to praise him and speak good of him and raise him and extol him because he was a scholar of hadith, Ya'qub bin Shayba. But when he fell into this bid'ah and he made it public, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal refuted him. And when they asked him, these are the words that he used against him. Sahib bid'ah. And then Imam al-Dhahabi in his seer, Alam al-Nubala, Imam al-Dhahabi said that when Imam Ahmed spoke against him, he said over a thousand scholars of hadith abandoned Ya'qub bin Shayba. So now, when we talk about Ahlul Bidat, they say Maktab al-Salafiyya or Shaykh Rabi'i or Shaykh al-Fawzan that they are refuting because Shaykh, Shaykh al-Fawzan has refutations. Shaykh al-Fawzan has refutations. He refutes jama'at. You know, in those as'ila, manhajiyya. In those questions and, and answers, that uh, as'ila wa ajwiba in the amur al-manhajiyya, in the affairs of manhaj. That when he was asked question after question, there's hardly a jama'ah that he leaves. Hardly a jama'ah. You name it, he refutes them. By name. They ask him about fulan and fulan. You know, some of the, even, you know, like Maududi or Qutb or Ikhwan al-Muslimin or Jama'at al-Tabliq. He's refuting them. The Quburiya, the Sufiya. One by one, they're asking him and he's refuting them. And that book is a tremendous book in terms of understanding the usul of the manhaj of Da'wat al-Salafiyya. But the point is here in reality that if a person has evidence and proofs to refute another person because his bid'ah and his deviation is public, like for a person, for, a, for example, a person who says that, uh, that, that Saudi Arabia is a, is, a, is a state of kufr and they are upon kufr and this is a dola, there is a dola kufriya, it is an unbelieving nation. We're supposed to stay quiet and not, not defend, number one, this nation, and secondly, not defend the sunnah from his bid'ah, because what he has uttered is against the sunnah. A person who says that I want to call all the people to march out in the streets against the rulers of Pakistan, we say, no, we're not going out to march because that is not from the sunnah. And that is not from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be marching in this country or in Britain or in France or in India, protesting and marching is not from the Sunnah. Now if a person publicly calls to it and then he uses a hadith, like our brother Ustad, he mentioned the hadith that they use from Adab al-Mufrath about the man who complained to the Prophet about his neighbor. So the Prophet said, take your furniture out into the street and if anyone asks you, explain to them that your neighbor has oppressed you. They say, look, that's the evidence for protesting. That's not an evidence for protesting. That's got nothing to do with politics. That's the harm of a neighbor upon a neighbor. How are you going to extrapolate from that and walk out and thousands of you march in the streets against the Muslim ruler when the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, you will have rulers over you, you will have, you will have a imma and they will not follow the sunnah, they will not follow the guidance and amongst them there will be men, fihim rijal, qulubuhum qulubu shayateen fi juthmani ins, they will have men with the hearts of the devils in the bodies of men. Hudayfa said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you advise us with, what, what shall I do? What shall I do if that reaches me? The Prophet ﷺ said that you will hear and you will obey the Amir. Even if he beats you in your back and he takes your wealth, you will hear and obey the Amir. Here's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about how to deal with the oppressive ruler. 
Let's say you deal with the oppressive ruler. And the salaf of this ummah by ijma, even though at the beginning when the when the issue was vague, yes, some of the some of the tabi'in and some of the scholars they were mistaken in this affair. But when the issue was settled through consensus of the of Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah, then rebellion it was clamped down upon. That's why almost every book, if not every book of Aqidah. Whether you look at the book of Imam al-Saburi, Aqidah al-Salaf Ashab al-Hadith. Whether you look at Asul al-Sunnah of the, of the Raziyain, Abu Hatim and Abu Zur'ah. Whether you look at the book of Imam al-Tahawi, Aqidah al-Tahawiyah. Whether you look at Asul al-Sunnah of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Whether you look at the I'tiqad of Imam al-Bukhari. Whether you look at the Aqidah of Sufyan al-Thawri and Imam al-Awza'i. And whether you look at the Aqidah of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and the son of Imam Ahmed, Abdullah bin Imam Ahmed, or Salih bin Imam Ahmed. Whether you look at Ibn Battah in Al-Ibana, Al-Sughra and Al-Kubra, voluminous works. Whether you look at uh, Imam Al-Lalakai, when he gathers the Aqidah of the Salaf in a voluminous work, Shah Rasul Itiqad Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. And other than them, even Abi Dawood, even in his lines of poetry, 40 lines of poetry, some of the scholars say 36 lines of poetry. The Ha'iyah of Ibn Abi, Ibn Abi Dawood, the Sijistani, the son of Imam Abu Dawood. Or whether you look at Kitab Al-Sunnah, of Ibn Majah or Kitab Sunnah of Abu Dawood. All of these are books where the manhaj and the usul and the aqidah is collected. Every single last one of them forbids rebellion against the Muslim ruler, whether in speech or in action. They forbid it and they forbid raising the sword. That's why Imam al Bukhari said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, I traveled for 46 years, studied on, under over a thousand scholars. And I visited land after land, generation after generation. And these scholars, over a thousand of them, he's collected ijma that they did not differ over the following affairs. What was one of those affairs? They forbade the raising of the sword against the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then another point that he mentions that they forbade takfir, that they would not declare each other to be kuffar. On top of that, he mentioned that they would make dua for the Muslim ruler and they would not rebel against them. This is the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah agreed upon. So now, if a person opposes that, well, we stay quiet. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, well, takum minkum ummatun yad'una ila al-khair, wa ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna anil munkar, ulaika humul mufli'oon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, let there rise from, from among you a group of people who enjoy all that which is good, meaning they call to all that which is good, meaning Islam. They enjoy the good and they forbid the evil. Indeed, they are the successful ones. So we are not supposed to forbid evil. A man next to me is, is worshipping other than Allah. I don't say, Ya Akhi, fear Allah. Call upon Allah, don't call upon the dead people in the graves. I leave him alone. I don't, I don't forbid the evil. A man says, I'm going to take my wife and, we're, and, and the families and the street and we're going to go marching in the streets because this ruler, we have to forbid him. What do I say to him? Allah <laughs> what do I do? Make dua for his journey or do I prevent him? What's the manhaj of Ahlul Sunnah? To prevent him. Then I say to him, where do you get that from? He said, I got it from Fulan. He's calling all of the Ummah. And what do I do? Just remain silent? The scholar should remain silent against Bid'ah. A man is declaring a ruler to be a Kafir. A man is saying that the ruler is a, an, an enemy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because he doesn't listen to me. So now the scholars are supposed to stay quiet and not refute this bid'ah of theirs of calling the people to march in the streets. Marching in the streets is not from the islah of the ummah. And it has never been from the islah of the ummah. Not from the sahaba, not from the tabi'een, not from the atbal tabi'een, not from the four imams of the madhabs, not from the aimma of hadith, the, the scholars of hadith and the muhaditheen, not from the early times, not from the middle ages, not from Ibn Taymiyyah, not from Ibn Qayyim, not from Ibn Hajar, not from the great scholars and the imams. None of them did it. This is a modern day Marxist invention. That's where they got it from. They got it from the Bolshevik revolution in, the 19, in 1917 and 1918, straight after the Second World War. When the Bolsheviks came into power, this was their method. And then it continued amongst the kuffar, as Sheikh al-Albani has mentioned, rahimahullah. Then the Muslims, they say, we're going to use, they say that we want to, Islam, we want to establish the Sharia of Allah, yet they use the methodology of the kuffar, that which happened in Beijing Square, you know, in, the, in 1990. And they look at those type of events, they say, look at those people, those socialists, and how they stood up against the 
tyrannical rule of the communists. Maybe we should borrow that. Islam of the Ummah will not take place like that. So we say that when a person opposes the aqidah, if a person says Allah is everywhere and he advertises it and he promotes it and he speaks with it, then it is wajib upon a group of the Ummah to refute him. If you don't refute him, then don't quote that hadith. Waltakum minkum ummatun yad'una ila al-qayr. You are not part of that ayah. The ayah is for those who call to Islam and they enjoy the good and they forbid the evil. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran a few ayat later, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. That you are the best ummah raised up for mankind because you enjoy the good and you forbid the evil. And you believe in Allah, meaning that you have aqeedah. You believe in Tawheed, you establish the Tawheed of Allah, but you enjoy the good and you forbid the evil. So we don't forbid the evil, we just remain silent. Let this one worship the dead, let that one worship the jinn, let that one carry out magic, let that one say Allah is everywhere, let them make money out of these graves, like the graves of like the grave in uh, Cairo, or in Egypt, of, of, of Al-Badawi, and the Tijaniyyah, and the Naqshbandiyyah, and their graves in Bukhara and other places. What, we just let them carry on? And what if it was your father, you wouldn't advise him? Father, don't go. But mother, don't go. My son, don't go. Or will you let them go? But it doesn't matter. Let them go and commit shirk. Or will you forbid them? What if your son comes to you tomorrow and says the rulers are all kuffar? What are you going to say? Say, stay silent? Then they want to blame us for clarifying the truth. Will you blame Imam Ahmed for refuting Ahlul Bid'ah? Will you refute Abdullah ibn Umar, the first hadith in Sahih Muslim? When they came to him, Yahya bin Ya'mar, and was it Abdurrahman ibn al-Himyari? The first hadith anyway in Sahih Muslim. And they said that the first person to speak about Qadr in Iraq was Ma'bad al-Juhani. So we said, let us go to Hajj Umrah and look for one of the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and ask him about this man. Or ask him about the decree, the, the Qadr of Allah. So what have they done? Already they've named the Muqtadi' Ma'bad al-Juhani. They've already named him. That this man is the one who spoke about Qadr. Let us now find a companion who's going to advise us. So who did they find? Abdullah ibn Umar. When they told Abdullah ibn Umar that they are people who ascribe themselves to knowledge, they have some ilm. They're not jahil. They said that they have something of ilm with them. And they're talking about the pre-decree. They say that Allah does not know of an affair up until it occurs. He said, then inform them that Abdullah ibn Umar is free of them. And they are free of him. I have nothing to do with them. They have nothing to do with me. This is Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, don't sit with the people of desire, the people of bid'ah. For indeed, they will cause a sickness in your hearts. So will they speak about him? What about Abu Umama al-Bahili? When he saw on the road to, on the, road to the Jamia Masjid in Damascus. And the narration is authentic. If I recall, it is in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. Sheikh al-Bani authenticated it. When they were walking... Uh, his student I've forgotten his name anyway his student was with Abu Umam al-Bahili and they saw that the rulers had decapitated that they had taken the heads of the Khawarij and they put them on stakes on the road leading to the uh, Jamia Masjid in Damascus so Abu Umama stopped at one of them and he said they used to be upon Islam and then they exited. And then he said, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they would recite the Quran and it will not go beyond their collarbone. It will not go beyond their throats. Then he said, Ha'ulai kilabun nar. They are the dogs of the hellfire. So they said to him, Did you hear this from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, If I had only heard it once. Rather, I heard it once, twice, three times, and he continued. He said, otherwise I would never have narrated it. This is Abu Umama refuting them. They're dead. What are the Khawarij? They were rebelling against the ruler. Abu Umama didn't say, look at that ruler, look what he's done to them. Why couldn't he just put them in prison and let them go? He refuted them. Even after their deaths, he didn't stop. After their deaths, when they asked Ibn Uthaymin about Sayyid Qutb, Sayyid Qutb was dead and he refuted him. 
When they asked Bin Baz about Sayyid Qutb, Bin Baz said, read the books of Shaykh Rabi'ah. It doesn't matter. When the scholars, when the scholars were asked about Qardawi, Ibn Uthaymin refuted him. Or refuted his aqwal at least. Fawzan refuted him. Muqbil refuted him. Rabi refuted him. Why? Because these people are misguiding the ummah. So when the misguidance of the ummah occurs at the hands of any person, whether in the east or the west, then it is upon the body of the Muslim ummah to defend the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa to remain, to keep it pristine. So let them attack Maktaba Salafi, it doesn't harm us. If we refuted anyone without evidence, then bring it. Simple as that. And we've been saying this for 20 years, maybe 25 years. If we refuted someone without evidence and without justice and without proof, then name that person, show us where we refuted him and we did not bring out evidence. Or that you don't know the evidence, then ask for it and we'll give it to you. But the problem is here, it is not the fact that Salafi publications are refuting or Sheikh Rabi is refuting or Sheikh Ubaid is refuting or Fawzan refuted or Muqbil refuted or Zayd al-Madkhali refuted or Ahmed al-Najmi refuted or Al-Albani refuted. What Al-Albani didn't refute anyone? What did he do to Ramadan Bouti? Go and read the Tawassal of Sheikh Al-Albani and you see how he refutes him. Al-Albani didn't refute Abdullah Azzam. Go and see how he refutes him. What, these are ulama that didn't refute? What, Bin Bazin refutes Sabuni? These scholars refuted. And they refuted. It was Bin Baz who refuted Safar and Salman. But why? For the protection of the Ummah from misguidance. Same reason why Jahan bin Safwan was refuted. And Ma'bad al Juhani was refuted. And Bishr al Marisi was refuted. They are being refuted not because I have any personal grudge against them. Who cares? They don't owe me anything and I don't owe them anything. They didn't take my wealth and I don't want their wealth. Nor am I jealous of anything that they possess because what we have is the richest of all things that we possess and that is the kitab and the sunnah and adherence to it. That's what we have. So if they have a problem with Maktaba Salafiyah or with all of these scholars that I've mentioned, then where's the real problem? Do they have a problem with Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah? Look at all of his rudud. If I sat here naming all of the people that Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah refuted, we'll be here till Fajr. We'll have to get much more fatawa here. Because I won't know how many people he's refuted so many people that I can't, I can't list them. This is Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim likewise. They have, they have volumes of, of books. Radha al Jahmiya. You know, look at uh, Minhaj al Sunnah Nabawiya, which is a refutation in what, seven volumes? Of the Rafida by Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So I call Mursala. Refutation of the Jahmiyyah. These are books written by the great scholars. Ijtima Jiyushul Islamiyyah. Right? These are. Look at the title of the book. The gathering of the armies of Islam against the Mu'attila wal Jahmiyyah. Against those who deny the attributes of Allah. These are the books of Ibn Taymiyyah. And Ibn Qayyim. They didn't refute the people. They refuted but bil haq. With the truth. If they say that the only thing that you do at Maktaba Salafiyah is refute. Then we say this is untrue and this is a lie and this is false propaganda and you are trying to scare the people away. I say go to the website salafisounds.com salafisounds.com is a website that has all of the lectures of the speakers of Salafi publications. Abu Hakim, Abu Idris, Abu Iyad, Uwais al Tawil, Hassan al Somali, Abu Khadija, Abdul Ilal al Hamami, and more. From those who have either they cooperate with us or that they are, you know, from the founders of Maktab Abu Talha, Rahimahullah, Abu Uwais. Look at the titles. And just do a percentage for yourself. How many, what percentage of all of those talks are refutations? And what are non-refutations? Meaning, if you look, if you're looking for refutations, you'll find them on Salafi Sounds. But what percentage of all of the talks are refutations? Because when you look there, Balughul Maram is explained. Abu Hakim must have hundreds and hundreds 
of lectures just on tafsir of Ibn Kathir. A Rahbiya explanation, which is the you know a book on inheritance and how inheritance is to be divided amongst the inheritors. Umdatul Ahkam, Kitab Tawheed Sheikh Al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Riyadu Salihin, Kitab Al Hajj, Kitab Al Siyam, Kitab Al Tahara, Kitab Al Salah. Now ask them, why do you lie? Kitab Al Nikah, Kitab Al Zakah, Kitab Al Talaq, Kitab Khula, Kitab Nafaqa. All of these are the books that are being taught over three decades, nearly, well, two and a half decades. How many, take the percentage, how many of those are refutations? And how many of those are actually non-refutation, dealing with fiqh, with aqidah, with usul, with fatawa, with the, with the arkan of Islam and so on? If they are talking about me, then I say go to abukhadija.com because that is where you'll find my work, you know, articles, not audios, articles. Take a percentage. How many are refutations? How many are fiqh? Meaning dealing with divorce, marriage, khula, child raising, cultivation of children, tafsir, hadith, bulug al maram, fasting, zakah. And take a percentage. And then come back and say, either we were wrong and therefore we apologize, or say that we were lied to. Because Salafi publications, the least of what they do is refute. Why? Because our manhaj is the manhaj of the Salaf. That if a person comes to oppose the Sunnah, then we refute him, but we carry on with our da'wah. We don't turn around and focus upon him and don't do anything else. What are these durus adab al mufrat? Refutations? Abu Hakim is doing tafsir in the month of Ramadan and outside the Ramadan. Are these refutations or tafsir of the Quran? So this is propaganda to scare the people away from the da'wah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Hadith and the Salafiyun. This is what it is. It is propaganda. It is to scare people away. Listen to what we have to say. If what we say is false, then we are blameworthy. If we refute someone without evidence, then we are blameworthy. So when we when, uh, when we translate the works of Sheikh Rabi or Sheikh Ubaid or Sheikh Fawzan or Sheikh Bin Baz or Sheikh Muqbil or Sheikh Zaid or whoever else it is, Sheikh Zaid al-Madkhali, Ahmed al-Najmi, if we translate that in refutation of a person who deserves to be refu refuted, then Alhamdulillah we're proud of that. Because we fulfilled an obligation. Fard kifaya upon the Ummah. We enjoined the good and we forbade the evil for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Kuntum khaira ummatin. That you are the best ummah raised forth for mankind. You enjoy what is good and you forbid what is evil. And you believe in Allah. So let them talk. They want to label themselves, we are the true Salafis. Then show us how you agree with the Aqeedah of Barbahari. 170 points. The Aqeedah of Imam Ahmed. The Aqeedah of Imam al tahawi The Aqeedah of... You know, Imam al-Sabuni, the Aqeedah of Allah Laka'i. Show us where you agree with them and where you teach that to the people. Because we can show you where we taught it. We've taught Asal al-Sunnah of the Raziyan. We've taught Asul al-Sunnah. We've taught Barbahari Shah al-Sunnah. We've taught the books of Aqeedah. Show us what you've taught the people. Because when you start, when they start reading these books, they start trembling because the book opposes their methodology. So you claim that you're, you're Salafiya and you're following the Hadith, then all of that is a false claim. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullahu khair.